Hello, my friends. It's Ranger Russ from the Megs Point Nature Center coming to you from Willard Island today. And I started early because behind me there are some yellow warblers hanging out. They've been in this cedar tree. Now it sounds like they're up higher in this other cedar tree here. So, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to see them. Hopefully you can hear them. They are tiny little yellow birds. Super cool. They're here in the springtime. And uh, just as I was heading out to do the program today, they were chirping right there by the side of the trail. So, today's program, we're going to be doing our Willard Island Trail. And for this program, generally we call this the Under Invasion Program. If you have seen uh, some of our other programs, I've spoken quite often about invasive species. And today we're going to get into a little more depth of invasive species, and we're going to do that walking along our Willard Island Trail. So let me turn the camera around, because right off the bat I see something that I do not see out here very often. This is a purple flag iris. I love these beautiful flowers. They like wetland, marshy areas. Um, so this is a great place to find them. And you can see these, these are leaves of the iris here. So there's a nice iris in bloom. And then we could have some other irises. So that's super cool that we've got that purple flag iris growing up, considering this is the place where I go to look for invasive species. I like it when I find something that's not invasive. So the first thing we need to talk about when we're talking about invasive species is what makes it an invasive species. And there are two main requirements to be invasive. The first thing is it's not native to the area. So if you think of an invader, that's exactly what an invasive species is. It's invading an area where they're not naturally found. And the, most of the invasive species show up in this area because of people. Actually, I don't know of any that don't show up because of people. I'm gonna take a pause here and show you. This is a pear tree. And I believe this is listed on the tree registry as the largest pear tree in the country. So really cool. At one point it was totally overgrown with invasive vines and we had volunteers come out and clear the vines from around the tree. So if you imagine, it was mostly bittersweet and it was stretching from the branches of the tree all the way to the ground. It was growing up all the way around the tree and this is a large tree, was completely covered with bittersweet. It was so covered with bittersweet that you couldn't really see the leaves to tell what type of tree it was. So Willard Island at one point was an orchard in colonial times. There are apples, peach, and pear trees still out here. And that's how we ended up with this one, the largest one. We also have the, uh, I think it's the second largest peach tree in the state of Connecticut. So that's pretty cool as well. Okay, we're gonna continue down the trail. And I was saying the first thing that makes the uh, invasive invasive is it's not from the area, so they are an invader. The second thing that makes an invasive invasive is that they're harmful to the area. And there are many ways that a plant or an animal can be harmful to a, a habitat. So if you think of this Willard Island, this is sort of an upland habitat. It's, uh, it's got some buffer from the salt marsh, um, but it, this would be an upland habitat. And the trees that you would expect to hear, see out here, some maples, some oaks, lots of cedar. We do have lots of cedar out here, um, but there are other things that are not supposed to be here. So how are the invasives so harmful? 
There's some evening primrose blooming on the side there. Um, we're going to come back out on this trail and do a medicinal wild plants because I've already seen a few that would be great for that program. So when an invasive species comes into a new habitat from another place in the world, generally the place that it came from, there's a balance. That plant or animal had something that kept it in check, either weather conditions, climate, uh, it could be some animal, uh, lots of different things could be the, the check for it to keep it from growing over and taking over an entire habitat. You have some little ladybird beetles. Most of the ladybugs that you see in Connecticut are not native. So we do have a lot of invasive ladybugs as well. So the area that these plants and animals are from, they have controls. They can't just grow as much as they want to. They can't take over an entire area or eat all of a food source in the case of animals. The area that they are brought to sometimes has better conditions for them. So the climate, the weather is more optimal for their growth. And another thing is usually there's something that's not keeping them in check. There's no species that will eat them. There's no, um, you know, like predators to prey on them if it's an animal. And then you end up with an invasive species. Okay. There's the salt marsh. You can see over there is the Cedar Island Trail. This is a beautiful day here at the park. There's a, there's a good strong breeze. Um, so let's do a little side weather thing. If you notice, these leaves are turning over. Uh, that happens when you get uh, strong winds, but particularly when the winds are, are blowing up, you get, um, there's a special term for it that I'm not remembering right now. And it exposes the bottom of the leaves and that generally means that there's a storm front coming in. So I have a feeling we're gonna have some, some more spring, early summer storms rolling through tonight. Okay, so we know invasive species, not from the area. Uh, they take over an area, they're harmful to the environment because there's nothing to keep them in check. There's no balance. Nature needs balance. And that means one thing eating another. Um, at a certain point, the animals don't just continue to reproduce. There's something that keeps them in check. I love these little daisies here. Um, and they, they're gonna take over an area. So you can see this area here was mowed recently. Okay, and we actually do a lot of mowing out here on Willard Island because it is mostly invasive species. And this is one of our big invasives. This is a, an Asian honeysuckle. Okay, now honeysuckles are native to Connecticut. We do have native species of honeysuckle. But these, and I'm gonna see if I can get, if you break it off and you can see this has I don't know if you can see it, a hollow stem. So the honeysuckle that has a hollow stem, that's an invasive honeysuckle. There is a honeysuckle that's native, um, but it has a solid stem. And we actually do have a couple species of invasive honeysuckles that have a solid stem. But if you see the hollow stem, then you know it's an invasive honeysuckle. These will grow and take over an entire area. So that is what they look like after they were mowed. Probably last year, uh, those were mowed. And then if you go over here, if I pan over here, this is what they look like if it's left unchecked. So this here is the honeysuckle. And it is, I don't know, eight feet tall. They can get larger than that. We've done invasive removal programs where we've come out and removed bittersweet and autumn olive and 
uh, the honeysuckle, and we end up seeing, uh, we were measuring how big the uh, trunks could be of them, and we've had honeysuckle that was like 10 inches across. So you can imagine that is a, a very large honeysuckle plant. Okay, so we've also got in here mixed in, and I'll see if I can find some now. There are multiflora rose, which is, if you saw this morning's program on dunes, the, the beach rose is an invasive. So I mentioned earlier that we're going to do a program out here on um, medicinal and, and useful plants. This is one that the Native Americans use. This is uh, dogbane, and you use that to make uh, cordage. So we'll come out here and do a program on that at some point. So right now, I think I see some, some multiflora rose in the back there. It's really hard to make out. I don't want to dive through all these bushes here. But under and mixed in with the, um, with the honeysuckle back there is some multiflora rose. We're going to keep going. We, we should be able to find some that's in, more in the open. So over on this side, we're going to take a look. You can see some of the cedars. Cedars are natural, native, and, and this is really what we want to see out here on Willard Island, are these. And then over here, we've got a beautiful grove of sassafras trees. I love the sassafras trees. They've got a, the leaves, if you crush them, they have a nice smell. It smells kind of like uh, a citrusy smell. Whenever I do this program with kids, they say it smells like Fruit Loops. So we should do a whole program on sassafras. So there's one leaf. They call this the ghost, if you imagine it the other way around. Here in Connecticut, we call it the dinosaur track. But most places that I go, they call it a ghost. Then a simple oval. And then they'll have a, uh, a mitten, which I'm not seeing any mittens right there. Oh, camera just turned off again. Let's... And then down here, so again, uh, um, that's the honeysuckle right there. And then this is bittersweet. So the bittersweet will actually grow up and compete with the honeysuckle. So you will get two invasive species competing for sunlight. That's why bittersweet is such a, a horrible invasive. They will actually grow through the tops of the trees and take the sunlight away. Um, they outcompete the trees. The trees ho are holding them up, but the bittersweet is getting all of the light. And plants need light. That's how they do their photosynthesis. That's one of the ways that invasives are harmful. Another way, uh, invasives usually bloom earlier. So here at the park, we've got autumn olive and honeysuckle. And if you're here in early spring, those are the things, the only things that are green. So it gives it an advantage over the native species. They bloom sooner. And as we get climate change, the uh, autumn olive and the honeysuckle are actually getting more of a growth season than the ones that grow later in the year. And then we've got poison ivy growing up the tree here. That's a native. We like poison ivy. I know you don't want to touch it, but it's great for birds. And I've talked about that in many of the programs. All these trees here, these are our sassafras trees. I love, they, they look so twisted and, and gnarled and they grow in a very irregular pattern, which I enjoy. Really different from on this side 
where you have the cedar trees, which are nice and straight. That one crooked one that you see right there, that's a cherry tree, so not a cedar. But these cedars, look at it, they're all nice and straight. We do have a problem here, and, and that is that the cedars are growing too close together. So they're actually um, keeping each other's growth stunted, and you're not getting the nice big thick trunks that we like to see if there were less competition. All right, we're just going to take a quick stroll over here. I really would like to find some of that uh, multiflora rose. But I want to show you this uh, sassafras grove continues right along. Look at all those twisted, cool branches. Doesn't look like something you would expect to see in Connecticut. It looks like some you know, tropical rainforest or African type of forest with all the bent and twisted trunks of the trees. Can you just picture monkeys hopping around up there? I think that is so cool. All right, let's scroll around. So out here on, uh, on Willard Island, there are three trails. Um, we went out on one, let's go, um, let's go back on this one here. I don't know if you all can hear, but the osprey's flying over my head squawking. That's cool too. Okay, let's see what we can find down this trail. So just like the plants bloom sooner to outcompete the invasive uh, plants, get a competitive advantage, um, the same thing happens with some of the animals. So some of the invasive crabs that we get here, uh, they reproduce more often and have more offspring which gives them a competitive advantage over the native ones. And again, if there's no animals that like to eat them, then they get another competitive advantage. So if there are um, birds that like to eat certain crabs in Asia, uh, and then those Asian crabs are brought here and the birds don't recognize them as food, that's gonna give them a competitive advantage over the crabs that are already here that are being eaten by the birds. So there are lots of things that go into an invasive species and, and how they're harmful to the environment. All right, let's... Uh... So as I walk along, I wanna let everybody know that there's lots of great information on our website, megspointnaturecenter.org. You can see vocabulary lists. Um, there are puzzles and games and all kinds of great information on there. Ooh, there's some raspberries getting ready to come out over here. That's a good one to talk about when we're talking about uh, medicinal or edible plants. That's really cool. So you should visit the website we also added on to the website, um, there is a, right on the homepage, information about other parks. So when, the, when a park closes, they post it on Twitter. So you can go to DEP's uh, Twitter page and see postings of park closures. And you can now also see those. There's a feed onto uh, megspointnaturecenter.org's website. Now here's one that we should talk about. If you look, this is a briar here with this slightly off-colored leaf. You can see the, the thorny spikes just starting to grow out here. Uh, when that gets larger, it's, it's going to be, oh, look at those thorns right there. So this is green briar or cat briar uh, or bull briar, also known as bull briar. And this will grow, it likes to grow, so you see this area was mowed as well. It likes to grow in previously mowed fields. And as I was growing up, learning about plants, I was taught that it's an invasive. 
Then later, I was taught that it's not invasive, it's just uh, a nuisance. So people call it invasive because it's a nuisance. So remember, to be invasive, it can't be native. So if a plant grows here, or an animal is found here, and it's native to the area, we didn't bring it, it didn't come over accidentally, um, but it's a problem for people, you can't just start calling it an invasive. You could call it a nuisance, it's annoying and a pain, but not invasive, so there is a difference. Nuisance wildlife, nuisance plants are plants that we have issues with for one reason or another. The power companies often have animals nesting on um, power lines. That is a nuisance. Farmers have you know, coyotes and other things attacking their livestock. That's a nuisance, not an invasive. I just came out to look at these ferns. I'm going to have to look this up. I think this is a type of a bracken fern, which are really cool. And there's another fruit tree right there. Looks like it could be, actually that could be a, a peach tree. Here's a cherry tree right here. This is a wild cherry or choke cherry, not a cherry that you want to eat the, the berries from. Oh, and here's a really nice one. This should be, uh, I don't see any blossoms on it. This is a dogwood tree. Dogwoods are, are pretty easy to identify. If you look at the veining of the leaf, the veins are a pretty cool pattern. Not a lot of trees have that veining pattern on them. All right, I should check and see if anyone has any questions. If you have any questions, please post them at any time. And I also like to see where, where people are messaging from. So if you could continue to do that. Are you allowed to eat any of the black raspberries that grow on the premises? So, everybody, hopefully everybody knows that in Connecticut State Parks, you're not allowed to take anything except pictures and leave anything except footprints. That's a really good general rule. Uh, I don't think that there is a rule against eating raspberries though. Um, and I do know that people can get permission to harvest uh, from state forests. I don't know if they offer permission to harvest uh, from state parks. So if you want to pick raspberries at a state park. That being said, I don't know any park supervisors that are going to be chasing you out of their park for eating a few raspberries as you're walking along a trail. Wow, is this the service berry still in bloom here? That's pretty cool. Oh, look at that wasp. Where'd he go? There was a black wasp there and I think he flew away before I could get the camera on him. Hopefully you guys got a glimpse of him. Here's some sumac coming up here. All right, we've got some people, so I'm gonna just pan over here so we don't be we're not looking at them so I believe this is a staghorn sumac so poison sumac is found in Connecticut but it's pretty rare and you can identify when the berries are out it's easy to identify because the poison sumac has white berries and the uh, the other sumacs have red berries but another way you can tell is by the leaf. So I think we've talked about compound leaves in the past. If you look here, this is one leaf, okay? These are considered leaflets off of the single stem of that leaf. If it has a stem and then another stem and leaflets off of that, um, that is, there's a special compound leaf. I think it's called semi-palmated compound. Um, I'm going to have to check that for you, but it's a different type of compound leaf on the poison sumac. All right. Let's 
So someone's asking a question. Um, is it possible to somehow encourage native animals to eat invasive species like birds who don't recognize them as food? Great question. So some of that does happen. Sometimes an invasive species, uh, a native species will adapt and begin to eat it and, and help control it. Um, I know that the gypsy moth caterpillars, when they first, we first started issue, having issues with them, none of the local birds would eat them. Now there are a few local birds that eat them. Not enough to keep them completely in check, but it does happen. So not a dumb question, really good question. Uh, encouraging animals to eat them, that's a lot more difficult. They really need to, to adapt to it on their own. And animals are pretty smart. They are able to adapt. Nature really covers uh, herself most of the time pretty well. So adaptation is what we, we hope for. Adaptation to help control some of these invasives. Okay. So we're back to where we started. And if you guys want to stick around, I'm going to go down the middle trail because there's a whole nother part of invasives that we haven't spoken about yet. And that is why not just let them be? Why not just say, well, it's survival of the fittest. They're out competing the local species, so they should have uh, the ability, if they can do it, they should be allowed to do it. The problem is with an invasive that has an advantage, and most of the time that advantage is caused because we brought it there, so it's, a, it's more of a man-made advantage. Uh, the problem is that the invasive is going to dominate and reduce species diversity. So normally you would expect to see 40, 50, sometimes even more species in an area. A few, let's just say we have an acre of land and you have 40 species on that acre and 30 of them are plants, 30 plant species. If you get an invasive that comes in, or in this case, let's do two invasives, the autumn olive and the uh, honeysuckle, they're gonna take over the, in the area and reduce species diversity. And you may have it reduced down to just those two species. It's possible that that happens. They can take over an acre so solidly that those would be the only species found. Uh, or you have a couple of native species that are able to compete a little bit so you get a couple of other uh, plants but the majority are those those two invasive species that's a really dangerous situation to have now you have an environment with only a couple of species if anything were to happen to those species first of all it would be quickly disrupt the food chain um, and you could lose the entire habitat if you had a a blight or something that attacked the invasive species. Also, you're gonna be reducing the food opportunities for animals. So you go from 30 different plants to eat down to two or let's even just say five different plants to eat. The number of animals that are eating them, if they can't adapt to eat the invasives, then they're not gonna be able to survive in that area and they're gonna to have to leave the area. So before long, now you've reduced, you're beginning to reduce your animal diversity as well. And the same thing can happen if you reduce animal diversity as when you reduce plant diversity. So it's really important to keep a diverse habitat, a balanced habitat. And those are two things that invasive species remove. They remove the, imbalance, the, the balance and they remove the diversity. And I finally found my uh, multiflora rose, and it's growing in an oak tree. How cool is that? I'd actually forgotten that that was here. I would have come down this trail before. Look at that. Multiflora rose. You got a nice big gap in the tree, so some, some soil builds up there. Just enough for the the rose to begin to grow. This is a really beautiful oak tree. 
This tree was probably here um, when it was an orchard. You can see the branching is really low. All right, I see, let's see, questions here. What should we do with the invasive plants if we eradicate from our yards? So that's a really good question. How to just dispose of those invasives. And when you're removing invasives, you can't just throw them away because you're gonna be spreading the seeds or giving the seeds an opportunity to, to spread. So very often you can um, put them in a pile, let them really dry out. Um, sometimes people say the only way to get rid of some of them is to burn them. I think you gotta be careful burning things uh, with the environment the way it is. Um, you can put them in, seal them up in plastic bags and throw them away. But depending on the species, you should uh, really look it up and see what the best disposal methods for um, the different invasives are. But it is a good idea to try and remove them. Even the trees before you know it, um, honey locusts, we have honey locusts around the nature center. And now we're beginning to see them popping up in the forest. Uh, in the wooded areas around. So I really don't like to see that. Norway maple is another one. We've got some Norway maple here at the park. Um, and they, they'll spread out. Think of it this way. Imagine if the Norway maple took over the habitat, it would take over. It lives in the same habitat as the sugar maple and the red maple. Imagine if we didn't have any sugar maples or red maples and all we had were Norway maples. Uh, probably not the best situation, especially if you love your maple syrup. All right, do we have any other questions? We've seen all three trails here. And we'll be back here. We'll do other programs out here later in the season. When we get a few more of our edible uh, plants, I will do our ethnobotany program out here. Sounds like a really complicated college course, but it's lots of fun because we're going to find out what, you d what the Native Americans did with the plants, how they used the different plants. So you can look for that program coming up. We'll make some rope. We'll talk about how they used the cedar trees, lots of things. All right, and we're gonna, gonna stand back here and show you this beautiful oak tree. This is a white oak, nice rounded lobes, slightly white bark. Look at that tree. All right, I hope everybody enjoyed this program. I hope to see you at 11 and two tomorrow and Friday and next week as well. We'll keep these programs going. Make sure you follow us or like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and let all your friends know how much fun you're having watching these programs. Maybe we can get more people watching. We'll keep these programs doing even going even after school gets out. We'll still do these programs. Uh, this is a great opportunity uh, for people to learn. And you don't have to stop learning just because it's summer break. So we'll just keep doing programs for you as long as you're interested in watching them. I will see you all next time. Until then, this is Ranger Russ signing off.